Hi guys and welcome back to Contract Law. We are doing videos for consideration and we're up to video number three. So we've already looked at the why and the who of consideration and now we are going to look at the what of consideration, the nature of consideration itself. Money, money, money. No, it's actually not all about the money, money, money. Um, the nature of consideration is a fairly complicated concept and it can simply be defined as you know, the payment that one party pays for the other party's promise but as with all simplifications um, there's a fair few curly issues that get swept under that particular rug so perhaps more accurately um, the case of Curry and Misa kind of helps us out here you can think of it as um, consideration might constitute some kind of advantage for the promisor or a disadvantage for the promisee. So when you're looking at advantages for the promisor, right, interest, profit, benefit, all of those kinds of things will fall into that category or a disadvantage for the promisee. You might have them forbearing, so refraining from doing something that they could otherwise do. Uh, some kind of detriment, loss suffered or responsibility undertaken. And an example of that last one um, was, if you remember back to Carlyle, dear old Mrs. Carlyle bought the smoke balls and actually inhaled them, used them as instructed for the two-week period um, as she was supposed to do. Now that constituted, uh, you know, a, a detriment to her or a responsibility that she undertook after she'd um, purchased the smoke balls and that constituted the consideration for uh, her obtaining that reward of the 100 pounds. So um, very broadly that is I guess uh, consideration in, in a nutshell if you will. What will the law consider good or valid or sufficient consideration. So firstly just a little bit of terminology. Um, there are two things that you need to bear in mind. There is the group of phrases which will get a tick in terms of consideration and a phrase that is must be used with great care. Good consideration, valid consideration, sufficient consideration, all are phrases that will indicate that the consideration at issue is acceptable in the eyes of the law okay in order to make a contract justiciable. Now usually this isn't going to be a problem where you've got something as obvious as payment of money obviously that has value in the eyes of the law. Um, however where it gets a little trickier is where the consideration is not money but it's something uh, quite apart from money and there is an amazing array of things that may be uh, proffered by a party as a form of consideration. We'll talk about that in just a second. Um, the court does not ask whether or not a party is getting value for the promise that they've given uh, in terms of whatever consideration that they are accepting in that bargain. What the hell is that? Now you can see why, can't you, just in pure policy terms. I mean, if everyone could start complaining about uh, whether or not there was legally binding consideration given uh, every time they were annoyed at their uh, end of a bargain, well, the courts would be clogged up with an awful lot of litigation, wouldn't they? So uh, that is the terminology, good, valid, sufficient uh, consideration that is the kind of consideration that will make a contract justiciable. Uh, court just doesn't even look into the notion of adequacy of consideration and you can see that notion reflected in the whole concept of nominal consideration. Um, there's been a mass of cases that uh, show a court will be prepared to uphold a contract uh, with very very little uh, in the way of what we would think of as value for money being given as consideration and things that are not even money. Uh, so in the Motorola case, that was a US case, uh, involved a patent that was being disputed in court. The issue was whether or not there had been a valid assignment of this rather valuable patent for a dollar and the court said yes it is, it's no business of ours to look into whether they got uh, adequate consideration. We only need to be worried about whether there was sufficient consideration. Uh, in Pennell's case, which we'll look at in, in just a minute, 
1602. Uh, yes, contract law, up with the times, folks. Uh, we still rely on cases from the 1600s. Uh, they said a horse, hawk, or a robe could be given as uh, consideration. Indeed, in the Nestle case, and I love that case, chocolate wrappers were considered to be uh, sufficient consideration. Um, but some of those little extract there that I've put up on the slide for you really spells out the, the complete lack of interest that the court has in terms of whether or not uh, someone is actually providing as consideration something that they feel would be adequate or valuable. So he says, a contracting party can stipulate for what consideration he chooses. A peppercorn doesn't cease to be good consideration. If it's established that the promisee doesn't like pepper, and in fact will throw away that peppercorn. So something that you're already going to throw away, the other party says, yep, I'll, can, I'll accept that as consideration. You're away, okay? There's no inquiry into the adequacy only an inquiry as to whether it was good or valid or sufficient consideration. Something of value in the eyes of the law. Peppercorn has value in the eyes of the law. So no reason why you can't uh, use it as consideration. So in the Nestle case where Somerville has this little diatribe about the court's disinterest in the value or adequacy of consideration, what was the actual consideration there? Uh, in return for purchasing these albums, as we used to call them, uh, was money as well as used chocolate wrappers. Now, clearly they're not going to have any economic value in the eyes of the law, but they did have some value in the eyes of the law. And what value was that? Well, because of the large number of these records sold, there was going to be uh, quite a lot of chocolate having to be consumed in order to get the three wrappers per album purchased and it was all about generation of sales. So whilst those chocolate wrappers, used chocolate wrappers, might not have been able to be turned into money, they certainly had value in the eyes of the law as part of that scheme to generate sales. So the concept of consideration can be uh, quite a flexible notion that the courts will apply. Again, no, no need to look at whether or not there was value. Now this brings us to the very interesting issue of whether or not behavioural motivation can constitute a sufficient form or good, valid form of consideration. And you have to love this little stream of cases. Um, in Thomas and Thomas, we have a testator um, who had conveyed to his wife uh, the right to remain in possession of the matrimonial home. Um, he'd conveyed that to her on his deathbed. Uh, he said he was transferring it to her uh, in consideration of his desire that she stay in the matrimonial home. Now, this conveyance didn't just involve a transfer of property or, or title right to remain in possession, uh, but it also involved consideration in the form of fulfilling his wishes, fulfilling his desire that she stay there, okay? And it also involved about a pound a year towards rent and maintenance. The court had a little look at this and said, you know what? just fulfilling somebody else's wishes. So they say, I want to do this for you. And you say, mm, yeah, that's good. Okay, I will let you do that for me because it's what you want is not sufficient consideration. However, the fact that there was a bit of money that exchanged hands there, uh, that was enough to tip it over into sufficient consideration. In Dunton and Dunton, I love this case, uh, the defendant agreed to pay his ex a monthly sum if she acted with sobriety and in a respectable, orderly and virtuous manner. Um, obviously, he reneged because you know, they were exes. Um, she sued and she won. Now, the court in that case said, well, again, motive of desire. Um, I will pay you some money if, uh, you know, you don't discredit me uh, in terms of reputation that's not going to cut it so far as consideration is concerned. Um, he already desired that 
a reputation, good reputation. So her fulfilling that wouldn't have been, much like in Thomas and Thomas, uh, sufficient consideration. However, what was good consideration was the fact that she had every right to be as disreputable as she wanted to be. And she stopped herself. Uh, it was this act of forbearance. I'll straighten up, fly right, and I will act with sobriety, respectable, orderly, virtuous manner. Uh, because she did that, that was sufficient disadvantage, so, for, so to speak, uh, on her behalf and was sufficient consideration. Uh, I'll come back to White and Blewett. There are a number of other cases in this area, most of them in the mid to late 19th century, um, but they establish that the court is going to be quite flexible in terms of finding consideration. Um, in Hamer and Sidway, you had uh, this youth giving up cigarettes and alcohol. Uh, that act of forbearance was sufficient consideration. Uh, in Jamison and Renwick, you had uh, the plaintiff agreeing not to visit or annoy the defendant. Again, sufficient consideration. So, uh, like I said, a very flexible concept. Where, where does that concept kind of get stretched to its limits? In White and Blue. There we had a son that was obviously fairly annoyed at uh, what he saw as preferential treatment of his brothers by his father in relation to some dispositions that were being made. Uh, this errant son had also borrowed some money from his father. He kept complaining and complaining and complaining about what he saw as this prefer preferential treatment of his brothers uh, to the point where his father actually says, I will forgive your debt to me. If you just stop complaining, uh, obviously where a relationship then deteriorates and a court's left to pick up the pieces and find out whether there was any uh, legally effective consideration, some sufficient consideration given for this forgiveness of debt, uh, the court came down on the side of no. Now, if you think about it, that decision by the court in refusing the uh, forbearance to complain as sufficient consideration is a very sensible one so far as policy is concerned. Why is that? Because obviously if I could extort any amount of money out of you just by saying, well, if, if you give me some money, I'm going to stop complaining, uh, again, it leaves open the flood, floodgates a bit, doesn't it, in terms of litigation. So understandable in terms of policy why that decision came down. Not so sure that uh, given all of the other range of behaviour that has been found to be sufficient consideration, that there is much of a distinction in that, although obviously quite sensible. Uh, what one of the texts does say is that mm, perhaps you know you might find uh, that the contract in something like White and Blewett uh, was not uh, validly binding, instead of looking at consideration, perhaps try and pick it apart on some other basis. So uh, perhaps try and attack the basis of intention to create legal relations or try and attack the basis of, well, it wasn't sufficiently um, uh, defined. There was ambiguity. There was vagueness in the terms. Uh, what exactly does I will stop complaining mean? You know, where does it all uh, play out? How does it play out in terms of in practice? So um, an interesting one, white and blue it, probably sound, maybe not the best basis to find against the plaintiff there on the basis of uh, consideration. Possibly something else could have done the job maybe a bit better. Okay, well, we've just had a little look at some things, some forbearances that were found to be sufficient consideration. Um, what about forbearances to sue? Uh, obviously, you have, uh, if you believe you've got a right to sue somebody, you may uh, threaten to do so. If you do that and the other party says, please don't sue me, uh, let's cut a deal, uh, the question there is, is your forbearance to sue uh, good and valid consideration. 
Uh, yes, it is. However, obviously, this can be used as an instrument to kind of bludgeon people with, can't it really? If you if you don't really have a cause of action against someone and every time you want something, you just say, ha I'm going to sue, and then you use that as, uh, as, as your uh, chess piece in the grand game of chess that you're playing uh, so that you can say, ha well, I will not sue you if you give me what I want. Uh, there's, there's the prospects of um, abuse there really, isn't there? So there's a couple of rules around this. Um, the claim has to be reasonable, not vexatious or frivolous. And you'll learn more about vexatious claims and frivolous claims in civil procedure, I would hazard a guess. But it has to be something, you know, relatively substantial or credible. The promising has to honestly believe that there is a good chance of success of their action and they mustn't have covered anything up in terms of that, you know, the validity of their claim. And the promisee must have actually bargained for uh, this forbearance to sue. So somebody actually saying, no, I, okay, I won't sue, uh, that has to be done at the request of the other party in order for it to constitute good or sufficient consideration. Um, Hercules Motors is just a case, fairly boring case, about uh, some litigation over a defective car where forbearance to sue was uh, sufficient consideration. Kalisher and Bishop Sheen, um, I think, is probably a little bit more interesting. And we had a plaintiff that honestly believed the government of Honduras owed them money uh, and they threatened and were about to commence legal proceedings to recover it. Uh, the defendant said that he was going to give about £6,000 worth of railway bonds if this action was withdrawn. Um, amazingly, the deal went down and then obviously the question was, uh, was that forbearance to sue uh, sufficient consideration? And they came down on the side of yes, it was. The claim wasn't vexatious or frivolous and... Uh, the, def the plaintiff was entitled to succeed. He honestly believed his prospects of success uh, were good and he had forborne to sue in response to the defendant's promise. Uh, so in those cases, uh, just the further example that a forbearance of some kind, including a forbearance to sue, can well be good consideration. Then we come down to just one little kind of uh, exclamation point that I want to put down for you on the, on the end of this video, and that is uh, looking at consideration as a promise or looking at consideration as a, an act or a forbearance. Promises on the one hand and act and forbearance on the other hand. Whether or not your consideration will be a promise or will be an act or forbearance, a refraining from doing something, will largely depend on whether or not your contract is bilateral or unilateral. Okay. Now, bilateral contracts will be by far and away the most common form of contract that you encounter. You'll have two parties or more and two or more promises. Now, each party is going to be undertaking or promising uh, something to the other party in return for another promise. So there is an exchange of promises. I will do X. Oh, okay, thank you. And in return, I will do Y. Okay, the consideration is the promise that's given in return for the other party's promise. Generally speaking, it's going to be in the future. Okay, so we'll do X. Okay, I will do Y. But in the case of unilateral contracts, and this is why I didn't really go into bilateral or unilateral too much in terms of offer and acceptance, because unilateral contract, the term itself is a bit of a misnomer. Uh, there's got to be two parties anyway. The only thing that's uni about a unilateral contract is the fact that there's one promise, okay? And in unilateral contracts, we have uh, one party undertaking or making a promise to the other party to do or refrain something, but there is no exchange of promises like there is in bilateral contracts, okay? Uh, there's one promise by the promisor, I will do or refrain from doing X if you do Y. What do they get in exchange? They will get an act or a forbearance. And we saw this in the Carlyle case, didn't we? The smoke ball case. 
So we had the smoke ball company saying, if you buy our smoke balls and you use them as instructed and you inhale the, the smoke for a couple of weeks and then you get the flu, we'll give you a hundred pounds. Now, Mrs. Carlyle didn't have to promise anything in relation to that, did she? All she had to do was take them up on their offer. All right, and by that uh, action of doing what was requested, the act was the consideration. Okay, so just as much as the act was the acceptance, the act was also the consideration itself. Okay, so that's really the only difference there in terms of uh, bilateral and unilateral. And, and now we get to have a little look at when. Okay, we'll cut this video off here and we will go to the last video on consideration. Bye guys.